live in Studio B with your day-to-day -day BYU Sports play-by-play. -play. He is Dave McCann. My name is Jason Shepard, and joining us live from Austin, Texas, he is the voice of the Cougars coming off a hearty breakfast and a win last night in Game 1 of the series. He is Greg Rubel. Hello, Greg. Hello, guys. Good morning. So uh, that was a fun one last night. You talk about tone setters. Look, and it's any time... You face Texas. We know how big of a deal this is. That was a nice way for BYU baseball to begin this series last night. Yeah, and it had been two weeks to the day since BYU had last won a game. Uh, they, had, In fact, it was a win in the Lone Star State. They got the series opener in Lubbock, and they went two weeks without a win. And so, you know, those six-game ruts, you know, when are you going to climb out of it? And Texas was playing well. They'd won five to seven, three in a row. And so a really nice win to open the series. And now Cougs can play for their second ever Big 12 series win with a win either today or tomorrow. All three of us here have the good pleasure of, of calling BYU baseball. And so we've got a feel for this team. Uh, listen to the whole game last night. Nice job. I, I thought the glaring statistic, uh, which will appear as a negative, is the 15 runners left on base in a game that they won. The positive is uh, if this team can figure out some timely hits, uh, they, they're on they have the talent to make the conference tournament, which appears to be the goal. Yeah, well, they, well, they took a step. Now, all's well that ends well when you leave 15 on base, right? It was, it was a good thing they won because you'd look back and rue so many missed chances. Two situations in the game where it's bases loaded, no one out, and no run scored. That's really unusual to have one of those in a game, let alone two bases loaded, no one out, and not get a run across. But again, because you hang on and win, you can kind of look past that. I think a positive, though, and a step taken was where they were on the weekend. Uh, they were really stymied by Kansas. Uh, they had only six hits with runners on over the entire series against KU, Dave, as you know. And then they had eight hits with runners on last night. So, yes, some runs were left on the board. Some big innings could have been huge innings. But they did hang, hang on to win. And that's why he earned that 6 nothing lead to have that cushion come in handy at the end. And it did. And a great bridge performance, too, from from Ben Hansen giving you a solid five and a third. Mason Olsen comes in, bridges you to Stone Cushing. That was a really good formula last night and one of Ben's better performances, I thought, too, till he ran out of gas maybe at the end. So really well done all around. Uh, it's a really potent offensive team in Texas. Uh, and so holding them to five runs, you know, scoring seven is great, but, but Texas can score 10-11 in a blink of an eye. So winning last night was uh, was well earned, and I think in every respect. Yeah, we know that one of the things with this team, there's the talent on the team is obvious, but you have some of that talent that's very, very young, and it's just going to take some time. And I think we're all starting to see some of that very young talent start to, to find themselves a little bit and get, get more comfortable. How, how have you felt about some of the young guys on this team as they've progressed through this season? Again, a good step for guys like uh, Chipper Beck, who hits his first home run as a Cougar last night. Keone Painter out of the ninth spot with a, with a big two RBI uh, base knock as well. So, uh, yeah, I, I think you are. I look back sometimes at, at last year's box scores and last year's scorebooks, and I realize just how few of those guys are in this year's lineup. And, and that's that's a tough situation to, to, to deal with going into the Big 12 with, with really a revamped, uh, lineup so few guys back from last season so there's a lot of learning on the fly in a tough league to do it in and so uh, credit to Trent Pratt and his staff piecing this thing together and making it work again they, they've played five so they're in their fifth big 12 series now they've picked up at least one win now in four of the five series now the task is to get a series win which they can do uh, today or tomorrow so uh, yeah it's and you know when you lose a couple of arms you were counting on which that's been the case as well uh, again, I, I credit BYU for kind of hanging in and, and grinding. This team does play hard, and and even though they had lost six in a row, this wasn't a team that was uh, you know, fracturing or sagging or, or or showing glaring weaknesses. It was a key hit here or there, keeping them from you know really winning a couple of games in that stretch. And so I thought it was a good reward for the team last night because they have been working really hard and staying with it and, and staying together. And they compete. You know, it's a team with a lot of compete, and you got to appreciate that. Last time you were in Austin was with the football team. That wasn't a great day. Uh, our poll no. question today uh, talks a bit about Oklahoma and Texas now leaving uh, and the corner schools coming in. Does that change your expectation for BYU football this fall and what the Cougars can do? No, I think you guys had a good discussion about it and kind of hit, hit on all the key points. 
um, you know, both teams, Oklahoma and Texas, uh, have had their struggles over recent seasons. They weren't dominating the league in football the last few seasons. They had been, of course, the historical trendsetters, and Texas was exceptional this past year. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you bring in teams that have had uh, sustained success in Utah or recent success in Arizona, um, but I think you, you put it well. The, 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 the identity of the league now goes away. And so the biggest benefit beyond strictly numerics and bringing in three or four solid schools is that you uh, put yourself in a position of stability when the Big Ten and the SEC are creating so much instability outside of those top two leagues. Uh, you, you're not going to disappear as a conference right now. And, that, and, and, and that's not something you can say about every league right now. The Pac-12 has already disappeared. The ACC is on shaky ground. So I think the Big 12 established itself as the next best thing. And, of course, the next big thing maybe an entire restructuring of college football as we know it. But either way, I think the biggest benefit to BYU or the Big 12 with the additions beyond the individual aspects of the individual schools, their strengths and weaknesses, is the stability notion in a very increasingly unstable world in college athletics. And for football, relative to football, I think my expectations, I think, are the same. Uh, you know, try, try and be a top-tier team in this league and certainly end up in the postseason, which looked like a sure thing for most of last season until it wasn't at the end. Greg, I, with spring football now over, what were the storylines that you were really following through that? I, I think we were all kind of hoping that there would be an announcement on the quarterback, but probably not surprised that there wasn't, that that quarterback battle will continue uh, into fall. But what, what were the storylines that really had your attention now that it's uh, over and we can kind of look back on it? Yeah, it's always tough to take so much away from spring because the games are five months away. I mean, you know, we're talking about practice. And and so I think it's it's good for the coaches, great for the coaches, uh, big for a number of guys looking to separate or at least introduce themselves in certain position groups. But I think maybe the biggest news was maybe the, the, the headline A-Rod made at the end with uh, Jake Retzloff's accuracy uh, during spring. Let's let, let that, that's a great takeaway. If you can play an entire spring of 11 on 11s or the drills they 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 chart and without throwing a pick, that's a really good sign. I, I thought Jake Retzloff needed more stability around him last year. I think Keaton Slovis, because he was so experienced, was able to handle the things happening around that offense last year better than Jake because of where Jake was from an experience standpoint. And so the instability and the struggles in different position groups around the quarterback I think I think really had a greater impact on Jake than they might have had on on Keaton Slovis, and so I look for Jake to take a big step that way because the units around him should ideally and hopefully be a little better and stronger and more consistent. Hey, I'm just impressed with the Allen Iverson reference. We're talking about practice. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, nice. Well, it's an, well, an old timer. Well, you know, right. It's really it's it's, it's multi purpose. You know, <laughs> how much pressure is on the offense as a whole going right to the offensive coordinator? to address the needs of last season, run the football, he's got to deal with a new quarterback and all of those things, but, but you got to produce points and they didn't produce enough last year. I, I think the fact that A-Rod is focusing so much on the run game aspect, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's tough to be one dimensional and have a great deal of success these days. And so when you look for that to be where it happens first and maybe best for BYU, but it, it's, it's, it's got to start with the offensive line. It's it's the one position group that's not dependent really on the others for its success. You can be independently successful as an offensive line, and then others can play off of you. So I think it really has to start there. And the new online coach is probably going to be as big a storyline as any as we as we move into fall. Uh, the addition of Coach Woods and and how that group responds to him and the kind of people they bring in for him to coach. I think will I be, think be a developing and key storyline as we look at BYU football this season and ahead. The voice of the Cougars, Greg Rubel, joining us here on BYU Sports Nation. We've touched on baseball. We've touched on football. Let's talk a little men's basketball. And obviously everybody involved, uh, you know, left feeling like, man, we just we felt like we were going to be able to do more than that in, in the postseason. Now that it's done, what do you think is the missing ingredient with this team that this team really needs to make the next step in the progression of the program and to ultimately get where they want to go. You know, I was watching Mark Pope uh, this morning on an interview he did yesterday from the Final Four uh, with the field of 68 people, and and he reiterated a point that I think kind of embodied this year's team. He said this year's team was was essentially greater than the sum of its parts. You know, this isn't a team that relies on individual excellence. Uh, you know, to, to to be an outstanding team. It's it's about how when the guys come together, they become 
a great team. And a lot of it was the fact that so many players were back from the previous season to this season. And ideally, a lot of the guys are back from this season to next season. I think those things will be as important as any, um, you know, organizational overhaul coach Pope could envision with the talent level on his team. Um, they need to, I think, you talked about missing ingredient, uh, whether it was the NCAA tournament or otherwise, I, I think the missing ingredient was uh, enough players playing well together on the same nights. So when that happened, BYU truly was greater than the sum of its parts. When it was up to one or two guys to try and carry this team, it was probably not going to happen because that's not how this roster was constructed. You weren't going to have those guys going off for 25, 30, 35 points that BYU saw a lot happen against them this year that kept teams in games. BYU really has to do it as a group and have the strength of the team be the team itself. I think there'll have to be the formula moving forward for BYU. And to me, again, that night against Duquesne or that day against Duquesne and other games was really a situation where too many guys having to pull too much weight and not enough of that team strength showing up with multiple players excelling at the same time. Well, Greg, we appreciate the insight uh, and the comments. As always, we'll let you go and get ready for uh, for the game tonight in uh, in Texas. BYU baseball against the Longhorns. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll all be tuning in tonight on BYU Radio. Always a pleasure, guys, and here's to a, a series win in the Lone Star State. Thanks, guys.